Good morning, everyone. Appreciate uh, you all taking the time to be here, both in the chambers but also at home. Uh, this evening will be our third hearing on proposed short-term rental legislation. Uh, the purpose of the hearing is to introduce our updated draft language while continuing to gather feedback for, uh, through city staff, stakeholders, and members of the public on the current proposal for short-term legislation in the city of Columbus. I appreciate Councilmember Remy uh, joining us. As I think everyone has appreciated throughout this process, we've gotten a lot of feedback and continue to appreciate uh, how that feedback has gotten us to this point. Uh, this legislation is a reflection of the comments um, and ongoing dialogue we've had. It's been very healthy and we, I think we've all appreciated uh, the participation either at the different hearings that were held in May and June at Whetstone and Schiller Park uh, respectively. We have a wonderful uh, air conditioned and wide open space in chambers uh, for those that have been to those other hearings. So hopefully a little more comfort uh, for participants today. I do want to thank uh, the ongoing work and preparation by Ken Paul and Aaron Beck from Mayor Ginther's staff, members of my staff, Cole Voidach and Kevin McCain, CTV for broadcasting this hearing for the public and all the interested parties and individuals we've met throughout the past year and a half uh, to have follow discussion. Also joined by Councilmember Page. So similar to uh, the structures uh, of the other hearings, uh, Ms. Beck is going to provide an overview of the changes. Uh, if colleagues have any questions, you can ask them then. Then we will uh, allow and have public testimony similar to the other hearings as well. If you would like to provide public testimony, please fill out one of the blue speaker slips. Cole shall wave. Uh, we'll gather those forms and we will uh, Look forward to your comments, uh, thoughts, questions, concerns, compliments uh, as they arise. So any questions for my colleagues, comments? If not, I will turn it over to Ms. Beck. Thank you, Council Member Cinziano, for the introduction, and thank you for convening tonight's hearing. On behalf of Mayor Ginther and our administration, I just wanted to echo some of the comments that um, you already shared about what a great process this really has been. Um, working with our stakeholders, such as the short-term rental hosts, our passionate residents and neighbors, um, the hosting platforms, such as Airbnb, the hotel motel industry, and really many more. Um, open, open communication and working through this issue together really is the key to a successful policy for our community. And so while we addressed this at the last two public hearings, I did want to again share the goal of the Ginther administration and our office as well as Council Member Stanziano's office to really find a balanced approach in ensuring the well-being of city residents while still allowing short-term rentals to operate and flourish within our city. So thorough stakeholder, a thorough stakeholder process and input while drafting the initial legislation really ensured that open communication. Um, and as mentioned, the two public hearings to date, we did have well over 100 attendees that have helped shape the policy as it stands today. And so with that, wanted to start going through some of the updates that have been made since those last two public hearings. We really did input um, assess the input and concerns that were gathered at those two public hearings and so just wanted to walk through some of the changes to the legislation. So first I wanted to go through additions to the legislation. So these are items that were not previously included in the draft. And first we wanted to address the issue of um, surveillance, which was actually brought to our attention through some of the public testimony at the previous hearings. And so the first, first portion that you'll see here, 598.04A3, this is just really requiring written disclosure to guests of any potentially dangerous or hazardous conditions associated with the dwelling or short-term rental. Um, the directive to post applicable laws and regulations as directed by the safety department was actually already contained in the previous draft, so just a little bit of an expansion on that. And then with surveillance specifically, the next um, section in number 598.04A4, specifically addresses surveillance. So Ohio Revised Code dictated some of the language to be used, which is why the section refers to an interception device. And so this section of Revised Code deals with interception of wire, oral, or electronic communication. And essentially this section is requiring hosts to disclose any surveillance devices associated with the short-term rental. So if a guest is uncomfortable with a device being used inside the dwelling, that device must be deactivated for the duration of the stay. 
And then, of course, we did add a definition for um, the terminology of interception device, since that may not exactly be clear on the surface. And that does reflect the definition that's in Ohio Revised Code. Another addition to the le drafted legislation is a penalty for hosting platforms that do not comply um, with the requirement for platforms to remove any listing posted without displaying a valid permit account number. So if notified a short-term rental permit is no longer valid, the platform has three business days to remove or deactivate the listing. And so a violation of this would consist of a fourth degree misdemeanor, while any subsequent convictions, the penalty would um, jump up to a first degree misdemeanor. And these next up updates are not necessarily new or additional sections of the drafted legislation. However, they are changes in language or policy from the previous draft. So one of the policy areas that received the most input and feedback was around the proposed day cap for non-owner occupied properties. And this policy tool was drafted with the intention of addressing the issue of long-term and residential housing availability, which of course impacts affordability as well. So after a robust input from the community and thorough discussion of the feedback that was received, it was jointly determined to remove the day cap for non-owner occupied properties. And so the next change I wanted to go over is related to the removal of the day cap for non-owner occupied properties. So this update allows the safety director to establish appropriate permit fees and costs for hotel, motel, and short-term rental permits. So, and specifically, it calls for a portion of the short-term rental permit fees to support affordable housing and home ownership opportunities in the city of Columbus. And so a permit fee schedule is planned to be established with the safety department, similar to the way that other departments in the city have fee schedules for their permits. Um, and in the interim and for implementation of the current proposed regulations, there will be no changes in cost for the hotel, motel, and owner-occupied short-term rental permit costs. So that's a $20 application fee and a $75 permit fee. However, for the cost of a non-owner-occupied short-term rental permit, it is proposed for a $20 application fee and a $150 permit fee, again with portions of that increased permit fee going toward affordable housing in our community. Other changes and updates had more to do with language cleanup and clarification as opposed to major policy changes. So these updates are high-level summations, and of course, um, everything can be found in the draft legislation that is available. So the prohibited discrimination language was updated and tweaked to reflect other sections of existing city code. There were language clarifications um, in the sections related to the grounds for denial, objection, and suspension, and the appeals process. So most of these were recommendations that came from working with the city attorney's office and issues they've encountered during this process with hotel motel permits. I did want to specifically address the section on appeals since on first glance it's clear a large por portion of the section has been struck. That section of code was a bit outdated and now simply refers back to chapter 505 of city code which establishes the board of license appeals and its procedures. So to be clear, there is still a, an appeals process for those who have been denied a permit or have had it revoked or suspended. And as outlined in the next steps at the previous public hearing, a delayed implementation is built into the legislation. So section 598.02A2, which prohibits operating a short-term rental without a permit, would go into effect on January 1, 2019. So sections 598.15 and .16, which are related to the penalties for short-term rentals and hosting platforms, would go into effect on March 1st, 2019. This proposed timeline allows the city to thoroughly prepare for administering and processing the new permits, and just as equally important, it really allows time to implement a public information campaign and to um, do outreach to impacted stakeholders, especially those short-term rental hosts to ensure understanding and necessary time to comply. So this legislation um, also builds in a thorough review and assessment of the regulations to occur two years from the January 1, 2019 implementation date. So while still in preliminary exploratory stages, our goal is to partner with a local entity to continue monitoring the issue of short-term rentals and their impact on the community, especially as it relates to affordable housing and the housing market um, during these two years, which will then help inform the regulations review. 
So in terms of what's next, um, the next steps in regard to the drafted legislation would be to have this passed at council and the draft is planned for a first reading on July 23rd. And our offices, both Mayor Ginther's office and Council Member Cinziano's offices, um, office, are we're continuing to work with the auditor's office on companion legislation regarding the excise tax for short-term rentals. And we are looking at a fall timeline to have a similar process in terms of public hearing and feedback. In terms of that public information outreach, again, that we're looking at a late fall timeline um, and to ensure understanding and key dates related to the regulations. So items such as application availability, processing timeline, the expectation to have the permit in place, penalties, um, all of those kinds of items. And with that, that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beck, for the overview. Councilmember Page, Councilmember Ramey, any questions or comments? One question then I'll ask, um, and I had to, but you touched on kind of the schedule and process for the hotel motex remittance uh, fee schedule and kind of where that process would be. Can you talk a little bit more about the calls, the service ratio language, um, and how that's envisioned? There's some confusion and kind of what the intent is and how sure. that would apply to. So the calls for service ratio is really just one item of many. Um, that is a reason why a permit might be denied or revoked. It's actually within a whole section that outlines all of the different reasons why a permit may be denied or revoked or not renewed. Um, however, it, it's not the only factor that is used. So, I don't know if that's helpful. Council Member Marini. On that same line of questioning, um, are we looking at um, calls or are we looking at actual violations? So in other words, somebody get calls repeatedly and um, there's nothing found to be wrong, for instance, what, what will happen? Yeah, I think that's a great question and I can definitely get some more answers to you from the city attorney's office, but my understanding is that the city attorney's office does have a process established where they are really reviewing all of these potential calls or violations and the items that are laid out within the regulations that explain sort of the reasons why we might deny a permit and then they make a recommendation to the safety director and to the licensing department to revoke that permit. So um, I really see it as the city attorney's office and safety work together to really understand what's really going on with the property, what those kind of shades of gray might be. To your point, what was the reason for the call? Was someone actually dispatched to the property? Um, they're really assessing all of that when making that determination. And again, that's just one reason out of, I believe, eight or nine that a permit might be revoked. Um, and part of what's built into it as well is, is the property owner or the, the permit holder taking steps to remit the situation? Thank you. Seeing no other questions, we'll turn it over for the speakers. First up is Jack Jenny, followed by Michael Jones. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. The way I read this, it is possible for a owner to be a host and not be on site, and in fact, no host would actually be on site. Is that correct? Is that the extent of your testimony? I want to clarify that, and then if, it's, if that is correct, then I, I have a problem with that. Okay. okay, so there is no, as drafted, distinction between owner and non-owner occupied uh, hosts. Okay, so in a residential neighborhood, that's an issue. Um, it's the stability of, of having people on site living there that, uh, that creates the, that, that stability in a, in a residential neighborhood. Uh, it helps with the safety of the neighborhood. Um, if uh, such a uh, operation set up next door to me uh, from somebody off site, an owner even out of state, um, I, I can see this happening, you know, that such an owner could buy up a lot of properties and have nobody on site to kind of shepherd all of these um, tr transient renters um, that there is no day cap 
anymore. Um, that would be a real problem. I would have to leave the, leave the community. I've lived in Columbus my entire life. At my, permanent, my, my current residence, I've been here for 38 years. I would have to sell, move to a suburb that saw that this is a problem in, in, uh, in the quality of life in a, in a residential neighborhood. Um, I'm surprised that the Board of Realtors uh, endorses this, this language. Uh, when you see their television commercials, you know, they talk about, you know, stable neighborhoods that are safe, you know, good schools and all that kind of thing. But it seems like they just want to turn these properties over and, and collect the commission. Uh, so I'm surprised at that. Um, so that's my position. Thank okay. you for the testimony. Any questions or comments? Questions? Just a quick Once question. Are, are you against long-term rentals as well? That's the same question that you asked me last time down at Schiller Park. Um, what I'm against is that there is nobody on site to, to shepherd these renters in the property. I'm not against long-term rentals. Those are a fact in, in residential neighborhoods. Uh, but it's the short-term rentals uh, where there is no host on site. To me, that's a problem. Thank you very much. Appreciate the testimony. Um, when Mr. Jones comes up, Aaron, could you speak a little bit to the permitting? Uh, so the process, as we've discussed, is going to require that we have a point of contact uh, through every host. And I think to some extent of what I'm hearing in terms of concern, that may get addressed with that permitting piece. We will be able to list, we'll be able to contact, we will know who is responsible on-site or off-site. Yes, that is correct. With the implementation of the permitting, there would be a person or an entity tied to that permit um, who we could then um, work with. I believe the legislation also requires each short-term rental to establish a 24-hour emergency contact for each of the short-term rental properties. So there again is someone that can be reached to deal with any issues that may be happening at the short-term rental. And it will put in place um, a complaint process as well. So. Thank you, Ms. Beck. Mr. Jones, followed by Joe Savarese. Good evening, Council President Pro Tem Stinziano, Council Members Page, and Council Member Remy. My name is Michael Jones, and I'm the current secretary for the Columbus Realtors. My colleagues, President Sarah Walsh and President-elect John Myers, have already testified on the short-term rental issue, so I'm not going to uh, belabor too many points. First, a sincere thank you to Council for holding two public hearings on this issue while keeping open lines of communication with all interested parties and concerned citizens. You should be recognized for this process. You've heard our concerns specifically regarding a cap on days, and we believe a compromise was accomplished. As the Columbus Dispatch pointed out in its June 25th editorial, quote, rather than regulate to the worst case scenario, better for Columbus to keep the welcome mat out for visitors and protect neighbors' rights with a vigorous response to occasional behavior that produces complaints, end quote. The key words we'd like to highlight are occasional behaviors. We know it only takes a few bad hosts to ruin or taint the concept of the short-term rentals. However, there simply isn't any data to prove that this is a systematic problem throughout Columbus. And in fact, we're talking about two-tenths of 1% of the housing stock, and that we haven't seen any tangible record of complaints. We know that 50% or excuse me, 50 plus speakers at these hearings, only a few neighbors raised concerns, while the clear majority of speakers were individuals, none of whom were corporations, hosting guests in town for work, graduation ceremonies, and even those visiting ill family members being treated at local hospitals. We want to thank you again, Mayor Ginther and his administration, specifically Ms. Beck, and Mr. Paul, and again, Council, for keeping an ongoing uh, dialogue, open mind, and a fair process, and in the end, an equitable compromise. We also applaud this group for allocating revenue to help address the housing affordability issue. We have stated from the beginning, we firmly believe in private property rights 
while also believing in neighbors' rights to a clean neighborhood. We believe in responsible property ownership and continue to encourage the city to enforce current code and criminal penalties when and where it's applicable on bad hosts and their guests. We believe this is a move in the right direction and again, want to thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, next speaker is Joe Savarese, followed by Brandon Hatton. My thanks to the uh, members of council uh, for the opportunity to add the voice of the hotel and lodging owners, operators, and managers, uh, and their employees to the current discussion regarding the most recent draft. I am Joe Savarese. I'm executive director of the Greater Columbus Lodging Council. I will confine my remarks to um, some uh, major changes um, in the current draft rather than the overall concept of short-term rentals, but I would like to start out just by saying the reason that we are engaged is that our organization is the representative of more than 250 hotel and lodging properties, uh, including traditional B&B operators and small inns, not just the large hotels, that employ thousands of local residents, provide 28,000 rooms to visitors from around the world, and service the entire population of our region. We are still a growing hotel market in Columbus, with numerous additional properties and projects in the pipeline. We have properties in this community that have been voted the prettiest hotel in the state of Ohio, the best hotel in the state of Ohio, and within the next couple of years, we will be the home for the largest hotel in the state of Ohio. Our comments on the new draft center on just a few key provisions and concepts. Number one, we do maintain that it's critical for the city of Columbus to create a requirement for the online platforms to collect and remit the relevant taxes. This model has been put in place in numerous other jurisdictions as we've discussed throughout this process. The language in the current draft specifically states, and I quote, short-term rental host must comply with the City of Columbus short-term rental excise taxes, end quote. The responsibility for taxes should lie with the merchant that collects the payment for the stay as the intermediary, in this case, the online platform. Number two, we have concerns whether provisions prohibiting the platforms from listing rentals without permits is strong enough especially when we've seen that when provisions like this lack teeth in other jurisdictions, they are sometimes ignored. Uh, don't take my word for it, contact the Attorney General of New York if you uh, want more information about that, which I've also shared throughout this process. In some other jurisdictions, for example, the penalty for the platform listing an illegal rental can be no less than $1,500 and as much as $3,000 with each day being a separate and distinct offense, so not capped at the amount of a fourth degree misdemeanor, but between $1,500 and $3,000 per day that they have those properties listed. Number three, there are significant changes to the City of Columbus Hotel Motel licensure law, uh, including language which was originally arrived at by an inclusive collaborative process and agreed to only in November of 2015. This includes, but is not limited to the elimination of the hearing appeals and remedy process language referenced a short while ago as party to the creation of the licensure law that this council passed in 2015, we would ask the council to re-examine and discuss with our industry any changes to the hotel motel licensure law, which in some cases impact non-short-term rental businesses. In the City of Columbus legislation report, file number 1921-2015, and I quote, this is what the City of Columbus said about the process that created the heels the hearing appeals and remedy process that was struck. This was a comprehensive effort that involved the development of legislation and rules as many external and internal meetings and discussions, public hearings and presentations to community groups. Throughout the process, the city has worked with stakeholders of the hotel and motel industry, the Columbus Chamber, Experience Columbus, community organizations and neighborhood groups to devise clear and fair regulations that support public health and safety, economic growth and the vibrancy of our city. That was the process that we went through in the creation of chapter 598 and the hotel motel licensure law, which includes provisions that are now being struck. I'm aghast to hear because they are out of date. And number four, the question of how we will still combat illegal hotels, the problem of those multiple units within one location operating as a hotel and avoiding oversight and regulation as a hotel under the guise of being a short-term rental is still up for discussion. While it's true that that problem may to some degree be addressed with current provisions within the code. 
If it's not, we will ask for follow-up on this aspect, as we have throughout this process, not to target responsible hosts who we have testified are an additive part of the log lodging package within our community, but to take a look at that problem of illegal hotels with multiple rentals within a particular location, which are um, only operating under short-term rentals to avoid licensure and regulation as a hotel. We appreciate Council's work on this issue and the positive steps that are contained in the draft, and there are many positive steps. I wanted to confine my remarks to the changes that we thought uh, needed some additional discussion, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Really appreciate the ongoing engagement, and again, uh, this hearing is meant to have additional comments, and we'll absolutely uh, take all the feedback. Um, I, I Smile a little bit on Chapter 598 because two members sitting here weren't here in 2015. Uh, so I appreciated some of the history lesson. I, I, you know, Michael, well. I'm, I'm, like you, I'm getting older every day, but I, I, I don't think 2015 was so long ago that if, if that's the reason, I think we should take another look at that. So. I appreciate it, Joe. Next up is Brandon Hatton, followed by Jeff Smith. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brandon Hatton, uh, Public Policy Associate from Airbnb. Uh, I'd like to start off by saying thank you to Council President Pro Tem Cinziano and Council Member Remy uh, for leading a thoughtful and engaging process. Um, it's been an open process, a fair process, and uh, I'm here to testify in support uh, of the updated legislation with amendments. Uh, there are still a few elements of platform liability that my company thinks run afoul of federal law, but we would like to, uh, again, start off with the applause of how far this legislation has come. Uh, and commit to working with the city uh, to resolve these issues uh, and figure out how we can resolve the issues that move forward al along with compliance um, and the issues that were raised by Mr. Savarese around taxes. Um, it's a great place to start there. Uh, you know, Airbnb, we want to pay our taxes. Uh, we want to work with the city to make sure that the correct taxes are being collected and remitted on behalf of our host by the company. Uh, look forward to having that conversation further uh, with the city of Columbus. Um, I, I want to speak to a, a comment that was brought up earlier about the element and the type of people who are staying in Airbnbs uh, and the proposed threat to communities and neighborhoods. Uh, we pride ourselves at Airbnb on our trust and safety, safety process. Uh, every host and every guest is vetted with, through a criminal background check. Uh, these people who are coming to stay in Columbus and in cities around the world are business travelers. There are people looking to see the other side of communities that may not necessarily fall in the, necess the usual tourist communities. Uh, these travelers are people who are trusted, reliable, uh, and over the overwhelming majority um, of these cases are people who are adding benefits to the local economy, spending money locally, uh, and those people should be uh, sort of heralded uh, instead of beat down because they're traveling on uh, through a short-term rental process and staying in residential neighborhoods. Um, the regulatory approach, again, has been really exciting here, uh, and I'd like to say again on record that we look forward to moving forward with the city, uh, continue, continuing this conversation, um, and finding a way to uh, collect and remit taxes on behalf of the host here in Columbus. Thank you very much. I uh, won't take up too much more of your time. Any questions, Council Member Maria? Do have a quick question in terms of when you've worked with other cities, what has that structure looked like in terms of working with liability or tax structure? Uh, so there's a conversation typically between our tax team uh, and the city officials that would be sort of over that department. Uh, it's a conversation that they enter into an agreement uh, where we would collect and take liability for the uh, hotel motel tax on behalf of the Airbnb host throughout that city. Um, and any further agreements are between, uh, you know, any people, myself and the city and figuring out what the city would need to implement their regulatory structure. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Jeff Smith, followed by Lisa Morton. Thank you for having this additional hearing. Uh, my name is Jeff Smith, and I represent the almost 270 members of the Columbus Hosts Alliance. Our mission is to provide visitors with a variety of housing choices and the opportunity to experience diverse Columbus neighborhoods, to preserve public safety for residents and visitors, and to promote economic opportunities for local neighborhoods while preserving or improving the overall quality of life for residents of those neighborhoods. We would like to thank uh, Council Member Stinziano and other members of Council for have taken the time to listen to hosts and learn more about the short-term rental industry. 
and how it complements traditional lodging options and also provides a unique and desired options for visitors to our city. We believe that the current draft legislation fairly balances the needs of, city, of the city, visitors, hosts, and residents, while also protecting the rights of residents ensure, and ensuring the safety of visitors. We look forward to continuing to work with the city as final details are determined and throughout the review period. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Any questions? Thank you. Next is Lisa Morton, followed by Nate Kaplan. My name is Lisa Craig Morton. I own Victorian Village Guest House. And I would like to thank Council Member Stenziano and the other members of Council and the Mayor's staff who have worked so hard on this legislation. Um, I feel really good about how far it has come and the outcome and the current proposal that is um, on the table now. I feel like it's balanced and I feel like um, there has been ample opportunity for all parties to really share um, their issues and concerns. There are two areas of the proposed legislation that I feel um, strongly about that that are somewhat lacking or need I, I would like to see more teeth or more effort put into those and that may be a second phase of this I'm not sure but one of them has to do um, with developers and apartment complexes who are um, leasing out you know building in a hundred unit apartment complex and leasing out 25 units of that right off the top as short-term online rentals that's a de facto hotel and I feel like they're using the online platform to circumvent um, the kind of legislation that would be required for those types of commercial operations. So that's something that I, I don't see a lot of detail in this legislation about, and I think it's something that I would like to see the city and council still address. The other topic, um, as others have mentioned, has to do with the collection and remission of the city's excise tax. And I've, I would urge the city to work with the different platforms, whether it be Airbnb or the folks from Expedia and HomeAway and VRBO, um, to have those platforms be more accountable uh, in that process and collecting and remitting that. I feel like the Columbus Host Alliance Group, of which I'm a member, has done a nice job researching that, and I know the Ohio Hotel and Lodging Association, of which I'm also a member, has done extensive research of other municipalities um, you know, putting some teeth in that so that the platforms are accountable. So those are the only two areas that I'd like to see more work on. Other than that, I think it's been a great process and um, would like to thank you for your efforts. Thank you for your testimony. Next is Nate Kaplan, followed by Elaine Paris. Hi, I'm Nate Kaplan. I'm a realtor and I attended the other meetings. I'd like to first thank the council for this open and engaging process and for coming up with an excellent compromise. Uh, I would echo the comments that others have already said about the collection and remitting of taxes by the host platforms. I think that that can be certainly done in a way that relieves an administrative burden on the hosts as well as on the city while not actually relieving the hosts of the obligation, of course, to pay those taxes if they don't use a hosting platform that cooperates with the city. Um, I also appreciate the amendments to the language in this draft that makes clear that an agent or an attorney or an association representing an owner can be a host. Um, <clears throat> With regard to the concerns that others tonight have raised about de facto hotels with developers setting aside a number of units in an apartment complex, I think that that probably should be addressed. But if and when the council sees fit to do so, I think it would be key to include in language for such legislation that, that only when those units are under common ownership. Um, for example, there are certainly condominium developments or homeowners associations that, that you would say would be the same building that might have more than a few units that are short-term rentals, but they're under different individual ownership of multiple hosts, and that should not get caught up in such legislation. Uh, finally, touching on the issue of homeowners associations or condominium owners associations, I would ask that the city give some thought, perhaps now or in the future, to adding some language to this legislation that adds some protection to hosts 
whose condominium unit owners associations might attempt to prevent those owners from uh, uh, availing themselves of this legislation to have a short-term rental property, especially if their attempts to do so run counter to the governing documents of that condo unit owners association. Otherwise, once again, I wish to thank council for this open process. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you for the feedback and the recommendations. Uh, next is Elaine Paris, followed by Reagan Oaks. Reminder for anyone that is here tonight that wishes to testify, please fill out a blue speaker slip and give it to Cole. She'll wave again. Uh, my, t my testimony won't be quite as eloquent as the other speakers. I'm just a, I'm an Airbnb host, but I have two points to make. Um, I'm in the Old Town East uh, neighborhood, and um, we have recently had uh, several people that have bought homes that are non-owners, uh, that are not living on site, that are uh, hosting uh, while not living on the property. And I, I find that as a resident of the community to be a problem. Um, and I hope that that uh, does not clear. Um, the other, um, uh, I just lost my train of thought. So th I, that is my main concern. I believe historically uh, B&Bs have been the owner having several bedrooms to let out and being on, on site. And I think that's a very important part of the community and it's a, it's a safety issue for the community. Thank you for your testimony. Reagan Oaks, followed by Gary Stuhlforth. Hello, it's so nice to be here. I was a little nervous about it, but here I am. Um, my name obviously is Regan Oaks, and I have been an Airbnb host for about three years, approximately. And a lot of the things that are being brought up at this point are things I already had concerns about that have been answered. But I decided to come up anyway, just to give you like a personal feeling about how things are going with me. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm just going to read what I wrote here. Um, I'm a retired school teacher for Columbus Public Schools, and I'm finding that after 30 years, my pension isn't going as far as I thought it was going to. And um, so there have been some real issues, financial issues with me in terms of new furnace new water heater, need a new question, and the other things that, frankly, I would be totally stressing about if it wasn't for the money that I'm getting from Airbnb. And I'm still stressing about it, but not as much. Um, I'm finding um, really releases, as I said before, my um, stress levels. And I also wrote, you know, having a cap would have been difficult, but it sounds like that's been taken care of. But aside from the financial concerns, I also want to take that this is because this is a social blessing as well. I live alone. It's nice to have people around. I've met people from all around the world, all around the country. I have learned a lot that I can share with other people and friends and just in casual conversations. I have enjoyed having them in my home and I've become friends with some of them when they're staying long enough to have that happen. And as a single woman living alone, I have to say I feel a sense of safety in having people in my home, um, which is something I'm not sure anybody's mentioned or brought up before. Um, so basically, that's my personal experience with Airbnb. Since you've added the most personal touch, can I ask you one question? So this is our third hearing, and what would be your comment? It has not been lost on me that we haven't heard one neighbor that says, oh, I'm really happy I live next to a short-term rental. Why do you think we aren't hearing from neighbors that are actually right next to short-term rentals? I haven't had any problems with neighbors. I'm not sure, I think I'm getting your question right. I've had no issues with any of my neighbors with short-term rentals. For one thing, I'm there all the time and I make a point of trying to be there when guests arrive because it establishes an initial connection and you can get people settled in, they know what they're doing, there's, you know, just calmer environment. Not everybody does that and that's fine, but that's what I tend to do. And I think part of that, um, kind of just, I just haven't had any issues with people complaining. It just hasn't come up. So. Gary followed by Judy Box. Hello. Uh, thanks again for having this hearing. Uh, the 
Uh, revised regulations still do not include any provisions that provide recourse for a resident or a neighbor who um, um, has, you know, ongoing, documented um, nuisance conditions that are related to operation of a short-term rental. There are, there's no, nothing within the revised regulations that provide a recourse for that person. Now, in the legislative briefing, there is a section on enforcement that talks about this. You know, um, uh, if, however, neighbor, constituent, guest, or any persons make a complaint to the city, the short-term rental will be subject to investigation and inspection. These inspections could result in the issuance of citations resulting in fines or and or jail time. That's pretty harsh. But it also allows for permit, suspension, revocation, and denial. That's the important part. It says complaints may be directed through 311, good idea, or directly through the licensing department, and the city attorney's office works closely with the safety department to determine when it's appropriate to deny, suspend, or revoke a permit. That's nowhere in the, the regulations. Now, I worked for a long time in a regulatory program, and I've drafted regulations, and I know if, if it's not important enough to put in the regulation, it's not important. Now, the, um, the occurrence of these bad situations might just be a small percentage of all the short-term rentals out there, but if it's you know, right next door to you, or as in my case, right across the street, and it happens, over and over and over again, month after month, it's a really important issue. And it's, it's right now, it's addressed in the briefing, it's not in the regulation. So um, I urge you to take these ideas that are right here that makes it sound like it's in there. I was surprised that I didn't find it and find a, find a home for it in the regulations. Um, that's all I got. Thank you. Ms. Beck, could you speak a little bit to that in terms of the drafting and where we are trying to capture that question? I, and I, I think, Gary, in the ongoing discussion, that has always been a sensitivity, that if there are incidents, how do we hold a, I'll say, a bad host uh, accountable? Sure. So actually, in the legislation, there is a section um, 598.05 that specifically is around grounds for denial. And then the very next section, 598.06, is the section that outlines also objection, revocation, and suspension of the hotel, motel, or short-term rental permit. So it is laid out specifically in the legislation. Um, and just as I mentioned earlier, and as was just testified to, it really is the licensing department and our safety department who works closely with the city attorney's office to make sure that they really are getting a clear picture of all of the complaints and issues that have happened with the, the property and really able to go through a process to make a determination of when it is a good time to object to a permit or revoke a permit or possibly deny one. Um, I don't have all the details today as to what that exact process looks like, but I do envision that as being part of the public information campaign that will happen later this year and in the fall so that our residents and our hosts do understand how that works. Thank you. I, so I know you got your hand up, Gary. I, I would love if you would want to come up and clarify on the microphone. And while you're coming up, and to your point, I recognize language matters. Also, I recognize that sometimes you want language that can be a little fluid, that we don't put everything in there so we don't miss anything and I think in some of our discussions with the draft wanting to be able to have those pieces in place that we, you know the structure is a big first step for the city of Columbus sure. uh, but we do need to continue to work out details whether or not that needs to be in language or through kind of the regulatory process that's something that I think Ms. Beck speaking to where we can capture some of what you were alluding to the back and forth. Yeah, well, I think it's very important to be included in the regulations, in the language, and the type of situations I'm talking about, they're not any of these things that are listed here. It's just not. This is all about, you know, prostitution and drugs and violence and other things. It's not kind of the, the, 
these, these things that happen, they're not really illegal, but they can have a really negative impact on people's quality of life. None of that is captured in here, and I think it's extremely important that it be and not be included in guidance or, you know, implementation policies or anything like that. Like I say, I'm very familiar with regulatory programs, and if you want something to happen, it better be in the regulations. I think, as you can also appreciate, you got to get the votes to pass it sometimes. Um, next is Judy Box, followed by Joyce Jacobson. I just wanted to basically underscore what everybody else has said. I haven't had any big objections. I do have two concerns still, though. This corporatization, there's been some discussion about how you can control that, and I'm all for that, because the, the, the theme of Airbnb isn't corporate. And on the people who are worried in their neighborhood, I've been a landlady for many, many years and an Airbnb host for two, and I have a lot more problems with my long-term tenants, and I've had no problems with short-term tenants. And part of that is because they're different people. The short-term tenants are people traveling from overseas or around the country. They're better educated, better able to take care of property, blah, blah, blah. They're just not the people at risk. Maybe the young people and the loud parties, but I haven't had any of that. Thank you, Judy. Joyce Jacobson, followed by Roy Witzel. To that, I just want to say I am a long-term renter and considered to be the ideal renter. It's been 13 years. Um, I do not have a problem with Airbnbs where the owner is on site. Uh, bed and breakfast, whatever, you know, that's, uh, in fact, there are many uh, people who are older, like myself, who need and want to have that added income, and uh, um, a dash of, of, of color to our quality of work life, our quality of life. Um, the problem that I have is that this is being, an, this is an open opportunity for investors to just come in and take. Um, they get it's an easy, it's easy money, and um, and it doesn't do my neighborhood any good. Um, we all, you know, neighbors know each other, and you develop a long-term relationship, and uh, with people coming and going, and no, um, and no one there to really um, monitor and take care of the situation. I am very uneasy, and I do not have the confidence that our rules and our processes will take care of that uh, in any kind of timely matter. And I think the fines are too low. Um, you need, if you're, going, um, if you're going to go that route of trying to, as you were saying, um, uh, anticipate everything that could possibly go wrong and try to cover that, that's, um, that won't work either. Um, I, so again, I think the neighborhood recourse um, uh, has to be dealt with more. I think also that this whole process and the way that we have these these meetings um, is is not necessarily um, equal in the weight of of fairness. Uh, simply because, uh, and I'll take Upper Arlington, even though it's much much smaller. As an example, um, a survey didn't go out and people didn't respond. I still know so many people who know nothing about this, um, whereas the investors have been organized. They are organized by virtue of their organizations. Um, so from that standpoint, I think there is still much input that needs to, to take place. Um, I would also, as part of my uh, testimony, I would like to say in the paper today, uh, in the dispatch, um, San Diego outlaws vacation rentals of second homes. Uh, the effect of the action will be to curtail investor activity in the short-term rental market while also barring residents and out-of-towners from hosting short-term stays in multiple properties other than where they reside. City Council needs to protect the communities. You've done a lot. Um, uh, to help the communities. Uh, this is not a help by giving um, a carte blanche with some, with, uh, with some structure to um, 
outside entities uh, to come in and just make money, just fool, fool from our, com our communities instead of add. That's my testimony. Really appreciate the testimony. And as Aaron alluded to, I mean, there is an ongoing commitment uh, once we have the structure in place to continue to look at the impact uh, the short-term rental uh, growth has on our neighborhoods. I think part of what we've heard a lot of feedback is just what is that impact that hasn't been done. Uh, but if we don't have a structure in place, uh, this proposal or another, um, we're going to continue not to be able to capture that. And so that's where I, I recognize and I hear a little frustration, uh, but also uh, appreciate in talking with my colleagues an approach that's going to allow for that reevaluation and ongoing consideration to occur. Roy, followed by Diane Burton. Uh, thank you, council members, for having this uh, meeting. And guess what? I'm not going to ask you anything about the sheep farm today. So, <laughs> well, my name is Roy Wenzel. I live at 1178 Francisco Road in Northwest Columbus. Our street is a typical Northwest Columbus street with houses ranging in value from anywhere from $100,000 to $300,000. There are a few young families, many older residents, and a lot of diversity. It's a very nice place to live. The houses on either side of ours are currently occupied by long-term renters. I know the owners of both of the properties, and they both live in the Columbus area. And the renters take care of the property and are part of our community. They care about the community they live in, but if the rules as written governing short-term rentals are adopted, all of this could change. Out-of-state owners with no vested interest in our community could buy up these properties and turn them into virtual hotels, motels, or hostels with little or no oversight. Other cities and communities adjacent to Columbus have banned the short-term rentals. However, moving forward, I would at least like to see a ban on absentee landlords and a limit of 104 days annually for short-term rentals. So my request to all of you is to not adapt the rules as they stand for short-term rent rentals as they are currently written. Thank you. Let's, we'll talk about the sheep farm another Okay. Time. Look forward to the follow-up on sheep farm. Councilman Remy, any comments? Our last speaker tonight then is Diane Burton. I didn't really come prepared. I didn't think I'd be speaking, but I'm a newbie. I'm a newbie to the Airbnb. I started in March and um, I just retired last year and um, I'm having, I've had a blast. It's been busy and it is not easy money. I do a lot of washing. I have two other jobs I do on top of it. So, and um, so, Basically, I've met so many nice people. I've learned so much new information from other people from other places, just how to navigate this or that, or it's um, been very, very nice. Um, but, um, but, but I don't have our, the community I live in is not an old community. We've been around 20 years, but nobody communicates. So nobody will, have, will come up to you to say if they have a complaint or to see if they have a problem or to let you know if there needs there's something. And I, I, I try to be very, you know, so nobody will have a complaint. But um, that's, I mean, I, I don't, I think somebody would complain first before they'd ever approach me. And, uh, but that's, that's our community. I don't think communities are like old communities anymore. Nobody wants to get together. Nobody talks. Nobody. They're all isolated from each other. So, but um, I didn't um, attend the other two meetings. So I'm interested in learning about that. So I'm kind of trying to find out more information about the Airbnb so that I become knowledgeable on it. Good news, Diane. You can go to the CTV uh, website on YouTube channel and oh. view those hearings if you have time. Yeah. Um, and could you actually share what neighborhood you're in? Treby Woods. Okay. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments from my colleague? Then you, Diane, are our last speaker. We're happy to provide any additional information that would be helpful to you from the previous hearings. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. 
So at this time, I want to thank everyone in attendance and those watching at home. I truly have appreciated the ongoing dialogue and feedback. While we are intending to have a first reading this Monday, uh, are continuing to work uh, with Aaron as somewhat the bill drafter on the ongoing feedback um, to where we are heading with this ordinance. Uh, Aaron, I really do appreciate the yeoman's job you continue to do, and particularly working with me, uh, but our ongoing discussions and working to hear uh, the feedback, and I do think a lot of where we're at today is reflective of that, and so really appreciate your patience with me and with the process. Also wanna thank my staff, Cole Voidach, Kevin McCain, CTV, uh, and the other staff members and my colleagues. Uh, this information continues to be very helpful and we will continue to have ongoing discussions, again with the intent for a first read on the council meeting on Monday, July 23rd. As always, individuals who weren't able to attend the hearing or have any additional feedback can always call my office, 614-645-8084 or email me at mstenziano at columbus.gov. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>